So, um, this is They Meet, We Mobilize, all about many struggles and one front at the People's Climate March. Would you like to hear it? Yeah! yeah. All right. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, gentles and ladymen, and all those in between, climate scientists have been sounding the alarm on global warming for over 25 years, and indigenous populations for much longer. But, of course, Global leaders didn't listen. The global leaders of our nations have made little to no progress on really stopping carbon emissions. And while they've been plugging their ears and making excuses, it has gotten worse. For example, since Obama has taken office, we've seen the Arctic sea ice nearly disappear in the summer months. Unprecedented! And yet, Obama and Stephen Harper to the north are both promising to increase extraction of dirty fossil fuels in North America. So we have leaders who refuse to lead to a safer future. These leaders will be meeting in New York City this September. Ban Ki-moon, the Secretary General of the United Nations, has asked them to come together for a special climate summit to finally make real progress on the issue of global warming. And when they meet, our growing climate movement will be there in numbers larger than ever before. That's why we're singing when, one, two, three, when they meet, we're gonna be there to demand what is right. When they meet, we're gonna organize and show them our might. When they meet, we're gonna mobilize and put up a fight. The fossil fuel industry is the richest industry in human history. Okay. Uh, that's right, because it's that huge money that has allowed the fossil fuel industry to silence effective action on climate change. It's the same huge money that blocks labor unions. It's the same huge money that gets away with polluting our water table. And they'll continue to get away with it until the climate is destroyed. In fact, their business model depends on it. So the fossil fuel industry has looked into the earth and rubbed its greedy little hands together and decided that they are going to burn five times the amount of carbon that it will take to wreck the atmosphere. Five times? That's a little excessive in my opinion, but they plan to do it and their business model depends on doing it. But our safety depends on keeping those fossil fuel reserves in the ground. That's why we have to stop them. So when they meet, we're going to mobilize. <laughs> when, when, two, three, when they meet, we're going to be there to demand what is right. When they meet, we're going to organize When they meet, we're going to mobilize and put up a fight. I admit that we're in quite a bind here because it's not just the fossil fuel industry that has put us on this path to destruction. It's, in fact, it's the whole creaking, grinding, burdensome system. The system does not work. And it wasn't designed to work, not for most of us anyway. What it was designed to do was take our global commons that we share with every living creature on Earth and transform it into private profit, profit for the few, until there's nothing left. To say the least, this does not help most of us out. And in fact, the system has uh, planned for us as well. Well, we're products of it in a lot of ways. We're taught that consumption is the way that we can escape this destruction. Consumption is the way that we can identify ourselves and express ourselves and form communities. And that's no mistake because this consumption isolates us and also makes us easier to govern. I mean, no wonder that Recycle is the only one of the three R's that has ever had any traction when it's the only one that allows us to go on consuming and discarding and consuming and discarding. The system is destroying itself. And this reaction to it is not working. We need to embrace radical change, or radical changes will be visited upon our natural environment. 
What I'm saying is that we need to get out of our bubbles <laughs> and step into the commons, meet one another, build those just relationships from the ground up. And together in our communities is where we can find solutions. And as we build those solutions together, our community's power grows and it displaces some of the corporate power that has been poisoning our ecosystems and our democracies for far too long. So we hope that as we, as we get together as communities and build solutions and then decide to step forward and share them statewide, nationwide, globally, that we can make real change and progress on the fundamental issues that we see holding us back. I'm talking about poverty and racism talking about colonialism and the patriarchal system. I think that if we start from the ground up, there's real hope. Naomi Klein says that we shouldn't see this, the changes that we need to make as individuals and a society to humanely address climate change as a kind of penance. We should see those changes as a gift, a catalyst to transform broken, economic and cultural priorities and to heal long festering wounds. That's why I'm so excited to be part of this movement. That's why I want to see you all together and I want to see way more people here and way more diverse populations here than are here at the People's Climate March. So let's sing one more time. When, when, two, three, when they meet, we're gonna be there to demand what is right. When they meet, we're gonna organize and show them our might. When they meet, they're gonna mobilize and put up a fight. So, you're probably not surprised that a young environmentalist like myself wants to tell you all about climate change and why you should care about it. But we're by far, at this point, not the only people who are looking at the, uh, impending global uh, <clears throat> ecological meltdown and getting scared. <laughs> I mean, I'm talking about the CIA, the US military, uh, economists, the insurance industry, they're all preparing for climate chaos. Just probably not in ways that I would approve of. But they have done a lot of research and we would like to share a few messages from these alternate sources for you today, but since we have limited time and since quite frankly it's quite difficult to read them all at once, I'm just gonna close my eyes and point until someone says stop. Okay? Ready? Go! Stop, stop. Ah. Public health risks. Let's see what they have to say. This is from the Risky Business Report on Climate Change, published by a group of economists. Not exactly your left-wing radicals. They say, what matters isn't just the heat, it's the humidity. Or in this case, a dangerous combination of the two. One of the most striking findings in our analysis is that increasing heat and humidity in some parts of the US could lead to outside conditions that are literally unbearable to humans who must maintain a skin temperature below 95 degrees Fahrenheit in order to effectively cool down and avoid fatal heat stroke. As parts of the nation heat up, the worst health impacts will be felt among the poor, many of whom work or even live outdoors or can't afford air conditioning at home, and among those too elderly or frail to physically withstand the heat or get themselves to air-conditioned facilities. I think we have time for one more. So, <clears throat> tell me when to stop. Stop, stop. stop. Oh. Uh, this one is about armed combat. <clears throat> this is uh, derived from the CIA report on climate change. Climate-driven crises could lead to international instability or international conflict and might force the United States to provide humanitarian assistance 
or in some cases, military force to protect vital energy, economic, or other interests. We will pay for this one way or another, says General Anthony C. Zinni, a retired Marine and the former head of the Central Command. We will pay to reduce greenhouse gas emissions today, or we will pay the price later in military terms. And that will involve human lives. These kinds of predictions are not easy to deal with. Uh, they're not easy to face, but these kinds of predictions are what this moment in history asks each and every one of us to face. We don't know who among us will be affected by which or which combination of the effects of global warming, but we do know that the poorest people among us who have contributed the least to the problem are already experiencing the most devastating effects. Some effects we're more used to associate with global warming, like severe weather, extreme heat, and some might be new associations, like mass migration, armed combat, public health risks like the spread of infectious diseases. <coughs> These things are all possible in this country, let alone around the world, if we don't do something now. So, we have to be there. We have to be there in New York to demand what is right. When, when, two, three, when they meet, we're gonna be there to demand what is right. When they meet, we're gonna organize and show them our might. When they meet, we're gonna mobilize and put up a fight. These effects are felt globally and over a long time scale, but they're also felt here and now, as I know that you know. And so right now, I'd like to convene a brief meeting of Portland, Maine and the flip chart in order to get some brainstormed ideas from this extremely knowledgeable audience uh, so that whoever takes this on in the future has some place to jump off from. I know this can be the stuff of nightmares, but as you all know, as organizers, there's a lot already going on to uh, make sure that we as a society can transition um, off of fossil fuels and through uh, the effects that we are inevitably going to be facing. Um, so we're looking at, at creating just transitions, which means um, which means creating groups, institutions, you know, projects, um, and ways of, of being together in your towns that. Uh, take the power uh, about these decisions about infrastructure, transportation, uh, jobs, away from the corporations that are causing the problem and put that power back to the people who need to create resiliency and live through these global changes, global and local changes. What it makes me sure of is that the pieces are in place. Um, technology is no longer an obstacle in transitioning off of fossil fuels. And clearly, in Maine especially, um, there are the ideas and already some of the um, work has been in, in place to transition in a just way off of fossil fuels. Um, this needs to happen everywhere, of course. And so the pieces won't move themselves to nationwide and globally make the enormous change that we need to see happen. But that is where movements come in. Movements might not be subtle, they might not be able to manage every detail of the transition, but they can, if we push them, they can push in the right direction and show the world where we need to go. And hopefully, together, we can build up enough pressure that leaders are forced to lead. Um, that's why we need a big, loud movement. Do you want to say big, big loud, loud movement? movement. Big, big, loud! loud movement to take to the streets in numbers. Of course, we don't only need to take to the streets in numbers. We also need the local organizing, the blockading of dangerous fossil fuel pro projects, the, you know, the groundwork of just building those just relationships between communities and individuals that are going to bring us forward into the future. But we also need to come <coughs> together sometimes as well as working locally and individually. We need to come together to show ourselves and the world how big this movement has gotten. And the next great moment to do that 
is this September 21st in New York City for the People's Climate March. And so I hope to see you all there. And I hope that you'll sing one more time with me. When, when they meet, we're gonna be there to demand what is right. When they meet, we're gonna organize and show them our might. When they meet, we're gonna 